Good morning. I'm Lori Brown. Welcome to this news briefing from the 253rd National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Francisco. We're joined today by Dr. Glenn P. Jackson from West Virginia University. He will be talking to us about his work on hair strands and how they could reveal the lifestyle secrets of criminals. Dr. Jackson. Thank you. Yes, the, uh, the research I'll be pre presenting later this afternoon is on the chemical analysis of human hair. One of the motivations for doing this research is to provide a more objective uh, analysis of human hair, um, mainly for an investigative lead to help investigators uh, identify prospective criminals and not necessarily to identify them on an individual basis. Um, so one of the things, one of the reasons we look at human hair is because it's so extremely robust. Um, there are cases of uh, humans that have been excavated from graves or um, burial chambers, and thousands of years later, their, hairs, their hair shaft is still intact. And this provides a forensic um, archaeologist, for example, an opportunity to do chemical analysis of that hair to see what they may have been eating or ingesting or what they may have been exposing themselves to. So we've built upon this research and we've taken human hair um, from a variety of donors. Um, we basically take that hair and then um, hydrolyze it down to individual amino acids. We then analyze the isotope ratio of the carbon, carbon-13 to carbon-12, in each of those amino acids. And that provides us with some um, information, if you will, um, into the, the origin of the food that they're eating or the way that they're metabolizing their food. Um, and we can basically build up a database then of um, these isotope ratios of amino acids from different individuals and, and basically go on a fishing expedition to see what we can tell, how, we can, how well we can classify them into certain groups. Um, and so here's an example of uh, separating um, the amino acids uh, just to show that we can do it. Um, and the results look something like this. We use uh, each of those measurements, again, in a, in a multivariate fashion, and so the, the data analysis part is a little bit uh, um, more complicated than I can describe in a few words here. Um, but the bottom line is we use a little bit of information from each of those um, amino acids and kind of put it all together. Um, and and in, in a case like this, um, with 20 U.S. subjects, we can predict um, the donor's sex with about 90% accuracy, that's with leave one out cross-validation. That means that although we have 20 subjects, when we build a database, we leave one of them out, and we build a database based on 19, and then see how well we predict the one that we left out. And we do that for each of the 20 individuals and see what the average looks like. Um, so that's, that's called an unbiased approach. Um, so we can predict sex. We can also predict um, region of origin. Uh, we also have another 20 donors from Jordan. Um, and again, we're using the same isotope ratios from the same um, amino acids from hair, and we can predict geographic origin here with about 70% uh, accuracy, leave one out cross-validation. Now, I realize that none of these percentages are 99%, um, but honestly, from an investigative standpoint, uh, that doesn't always matter. Um, we're, we're not trying to individualize at this point, we're trying to get characteristics about the individual to help investigators on a lead. And if it's, if it's uh, you know, three or four times more likely that the person is from Jordan rather than the US, then that's going to be much more helpful for the investigator. We also have applied this work, because we can analyze proteins uh, in almost any substrate, we've also applied the work to um, a couple of different application areas, one of which is insects. Um, and we've shown the ability, and this is what I'll be presenting this afternoon, the ability to link specific blowflies, whether it's uh, the, the larvae, the pupae, or the adult flies, to specific types of meat. Um, in other words, we can tell which species a uh, blowfly has been feeding on. And that's particularly helpful if you find a dead human with quite mature stage blowflies on it and you want to establish the time since death. It's very helpful to know how long and whether or not the blowflies have always and only been feeding on the human. Um, and so in this particular case, we can do that. Very interesting work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the question and answer portion. Uh, please wait for the microphone and state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Hello, so this is Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Okay. Um, I'm just curious as to how isotope ratios can tell you something about a person's sex, and also um, it mentions in the press release about BMI. How do you glean that information from isotopes? Yes, the, so I'm not a biochemist, let me say that first off. Um, but it, it is very well known that when enzymes act on substrates, um, they can influence the isotope ratios. It's called fractionation. Um, and, and the way that an enzyme interacts with a substrate to break those bonds heavily influences the degree of fractionation. So that's to say that um, 
If you have uh, a different class of enzymes or a different type of enzymes working on a substrate, uh, such as, for example, if you have a genetic disorder or if you have a, just different metabolism and you have different enzymes working on it, uh, then you can cause different fractionation. Um, and um, we know that, for example, uh, when people are in uh, protein deficiency diet, protein deficient diets, um, then p there's a certain stress on the system and they'll recycle the amino acids much more and the isotope ratios can get very heavily enriched. Um, so that's, in a, in a nutshell, that's it. I, I'm not sure if that described. Oh, the sex? Oh, well, we have, we have uh, different hormones, and we have they, those hormones like, uh, enable our proteins and the enzymes to act differently on, on different metabolic pathways. For, yes, and those, exactly, so that acts on our metabolic pool, for example, in our livers, in our muscles. Um, those amino acids are in permanent equilibrium with the blood, which is always cycling around our body. Those amino acids are then pulled out of the blood and deposited in the hair when the hair matrix is being formed. So it's like a permanent, like a chronological record, if you will, of, of our diet and of our metabolisms. Any other questions? Ben Vals, the chemistry world. Uh, in the photo you had there, it looked like you had quite a lot of hair to mm -hmm. test. Yeah. Uh, do you think that you're likely to be able to use this technique on forensically relevant amounts of hair? Like a single strand, for That's example? Ultimately, yes. I mean, that's that's just a matter of time. For I think I think the the way it's kind of a you know you can't put the the cart before the horse. We if there's no point trying to miniaturize an instrument or work on smaller samples if, if this isn't going to work. Um, and in the past, there's there's rarely been a need to work on such minute samples. And so the the instrument developers haven't tried to miniaturize it. Um, Right now, there, there are certainly are ways we can work with smaller volumes when we do a lot of the acid hydrolyses or the workup, the sample workup. We haven't tried to concentrate our samples in any way. We, we could easily do solid phase extraction, for example, and concentrate the amino acids. So there's certain wet chemistry steps we could do, and there's certain instrumentation development we could do to, if, if it was worth it, right? And the process itself, is it relatively straightforward, or are you adapting the machines in some way in order to, to be able to get the results you need. Yeah, and this is a commercial instrument. I mean, we, we do have the only installation of it in North America, but they are all over the world. And so it, it is a commercial instrument. That's not to say that it's easy to use or easy to work the data up. There's certain, you know, it takes the students a year or two to get very proficient at it. Um, the wet chemistry is all very straightforward, and we've borrowed, we've borrowed most of that from the literature and just validated it in our own laboratory. We have some questions from online, I believe. Yeah, so Christine Sa from the American Chemical Society has a question. Are sets of isotope ratios unique to an individual's hair like fingerprints? Uh, in other words, could law enforcement potentially use hair to place a specific person at a crime scene? Uh, I, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that we can do that yet, no. I mean, I, I feel very comfortable saying there's a 90% chance this person's a male, but you know, there's a 10% chance that it's not. Right, and so I'm, I'm not going to say that that male was at the crime scene for that, you know, that, that even though there was a male at the crime scene, right, there's only a 90% chance. Um, so it's not, it's not DNA evidence with 16 loci. Um, but that, I don't think that devalues it in any way, it's just a different type of evidence. Uh, the other thing that happened, I mean, for example, with DNA, um, first off, if that DNA is not in a database, it's not necessarily helpful. You, you have no investigative lead, um, in, unless you do some of the very, the more sophisticated cutting edge techniques of, uh, um, biometric kind of you know facial recognition type things um, so I, I don't know we also DNA is degradable and won't last for 2,000 years in a grave but hair will all right so we have uh, we have certain advantages and disadvantages uh, Bill Boosley, uh, American Chemical Society um, when you do your isotope ratios uh, do you focus on individual amino acids, let's say, uh, so, so uh, you, and going back to that, uh, what's the influence of changing diets? Uh, you don't eat the same thing as in Europe as, as in North America. Some people are vegetarians and so forth, and the plants themselves have, have different ways of incorporating C14 or C13 into, uh, what, what can you 
say something about that? Sure, yes. I mean, there's, there's another easy way to tell the difference between U.S. and Jordanians, and that's by measuring the bulk carbon isotope ratio, because Americans eat so much more corn in their diet and corn products that they have, they have very much more C13 than Jordanians. And so that, that's actually a little bit easier and faster. It's just to do the one analysis. Um, so, but we focus on the individual amino acids, and like you say, they have um, different origins then. Um, for example, we have uh, essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids, and the essential ones have to come from our diet. We can't anabolize them for ourselves, and so they're very much more dependent on the on the source of food that we're eating. So yes, that, that would that would that would make a big difference. When we look at the individual amino acids, there is um, a relatively strong correlation between all of the amino acids because they're dependent on our diet. And one of the cool things about the, the kind of um, chemometric analyses that we do, the, the multivariate analyses, is it kind of accounts for that covariance or that, that correlation and then looks for other factors that cause the difference between the subjects um, uh, or that provide the variance between individuals. Um, and that's, that's one of the things we bank on it, is that there are, other, there are other factors besides diet that cause differences between individuals. And it turns out that most of the variance between individuals is caused by metabolism, not by the diet. Okay, and there's an online question. Um, let's see, Carmen Drawl, freelance for Forbes.com, has a few questions. So the first one is, how easy would this be to adapt to routine crime lab use? Uh, not very easy at all. It's a, it's a benchtop instrument, and it requires about uh, three or four other peripheral benchtop items. Uh, like, a, you know, you've got to do acid hydrolysis, you've got to boil it in an oven, basically, for overnight. Um, and we have, to, we have to vortex them on a vortex there um, and dry them. Um, so it's not really, um, it's, it's not going to be easy. No, no crime lab has this. Now the federal agencies like the DEA, uh, FBI, they do have this technology, um, so they can do it. Um, but but regional, regional and local crime labs won't be able to do this anytime soon. We have also haven't demonstrated that there's a need for them to do it yet, uh, right? And so with this kind of a um, cart on the horse issue, we have to show that it's it's incredibly important and very valuable, and then they're more likely to want to be able to. Okay. And she, she was kind of wondering if you can um, talk about uh, the uncertainty, like how, how do you really explain that to juries and, and to the legal experts? Oh, sure. Well, this is, a, this is a much bigger problem in forensic science in general, is how do you communicate with lay people? Um, and, and honestly, even scientists have a hard time with probability and statistics. Um, we, humans just don't have a good grasp on probability. We, we just don't. Um, the, the biggest push right now is to kind of follow in the footsteps of DNA and to provide jurors with um, a likelihood ratio, like, like how well does the evidence favor the prosecution's argument versus the defendant's argument. Uh, which one is, is more likely, right, the likelihood ratio. Um, and uh, the downside to that is that even when the evidence favors the prosecution's argument, for example, with the ratio of 10 to 1, the jurors totally misunderstand it and think that that actually favors the defendant. Um, and what, what that actually means is that the jurors have their own, in their mind, their own threshold for a likelihood ratio, right? They, they want a certain probability or a certain like, 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 like a million to 1. And if your likelihood ratio is, is lower than that, they think it favors the defendant. It doesn't, it still favors the prosecution, but, but just not as much as they want it to. And so I, there's, we don't have a good answer yet as to how best to convey the reliability or the probability and then what probability threshold we need to exceed for it to mean that we should prosecute someone. Hi, so it's Katha Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the work with the blowflies and what exactly what the results are that you're getting there? Thank you. Sure. In that study, we uh, grew blowfly larvae on um, four different uh, carrion, which is like the protein meat source, um, and that was uh, basically different, uh, uh, like pork, uh, beef, chicken, and human, which is uh, human blood mixed with agar. Um, we raised the blowflies and measured the isotope ratios of the amino acids in the blowflies. We then let some of those blowflies live, um, the larvae, um, live to the pupa stage, 
And we then took some of those and analyzed the same amino acids. And we then let some mature to the adult blowfly stage and analyze the same amino acids. Um, and what we could show is that there was significant fractionation at each life stage, uh, which meant that you know, these enzymes acting on the substrates do change the isotope ratios a little bit. But that change in isotope ratios is incredibly reproducible and predictable, which means that we can work backwards from the adult blowfly or from the pupa or from the larvae and basically work backwards to the meat source. Um, we showed that there was almost 100% accuracy in terms of predicting the meat source um, for the blowflies in that particular study. We now have, um, we're working with the medical school and we have access to um, uh, human cadavers and so we're now working on human, human liver samples um, for two reasons. One is to see whether or not we can um, tell which particular human a blowfly has been feeding on but also to see if we can combine the two studies and see if we can determine some kind of biometric trait about the human from the blowfly that has been feeding on the human. In other words, using the blowfly as a proxy for the human, right? All the carbon that's in the blowfly came from the human. And so we ought to be able to analyze the amino acids in the blowfly and predict something about the human from which it came. Okay. And just in terms of blowfly life cycle, I mean, how long do these things live? Uh, it depends on the temperature um, and, and the nutritional source. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm not a, an entomologist, but I'm working with one, so she, she would nail this answer. But I'm, it's a couple of days, uh, whether at the maggot stage, um, it's, it's multiple days or almost a week, whether at pupa stage, before they hatch into adult blowflies. But again, it's very temperature dependent. Any other questions from online? No? All right, great. Well, thank you all. Uh, the archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACSLive underscore San Francisco. Please join us for our next press conference today at 9.30 a.m. Pacific about a biosensing contact lens that could someday measure blood glucose and other substances. Thank you.